Resilient communities? Resilient communities. Yeah, resilient communities are a little bit different than just maker culture. I'm going to try to combine the two, put my site up there, and then I'll go off of that. It's a, uh, you know, maker culture is making things, but it's part of a bigger movement of, of relocalization of the economy. It's a combination of that, you know, making things, making food, making, you know, har rainwater harvesting. It's a whole, you know, local economic system that's being developed in a lot of places around the world. And that's what I'm trying to put together for people. It seems to be working. The site's growing really quick, and people are connecting and giving me stories that I put up, and you know, doing the research necessary to make it make it really sing. Um, I'm going to try something new because I've been doing presentations for a long time, and most of the time it's you know often an outline that I kind of make sure that I go through all the, the bits and pieces. But I try a little scripted new teleprompter item. Um, well, I'm John Robb. I'm the editor of ResilientCommunities.com. It's a little offbeat. You know, I came into the space after starting companies. I started big companies. I was a tier one special operator for a while, uh, doing counterterrorism work. Uh, did some of the early stuff in blogging. Uh, you know, ran user land software. We did RSS and, and the early stuff. So we saw our stuff go from nothing to you know, 75 million people using it in the back end. Um, and over the last couple of years, you know, as I you know, started to cover the defense space and, and uh, you know, looking at where security is going long term, the, my conclusion was that uh, our best hope for you know, surviving the future, surviving a turbulent future, is to build resilient communities. Uh, and that's why I started the site, and it's been growing since then. Uh, you know, it reminded me of a story, uh, you know, I, I'm, my whole family's been Yankees, you know, way, way back, Vermonters, Vermont farmers, and they're probably the most tenacious of, of any kind of a, a farmer out there, because all the, you know, the good farmers left Vermont. Uh, but there's a, you know, classic story where there's this, you know, Boston couple who were headed out to a, uh, B and B up in Vermont called the uh, of all things the American Dream. Beautiful B and B, headed out there. Uh, naturally, they get lost in the mountains of Vermont because you know they're trying to find a small town that's barely on the map. And they start arguing, getting tired, and they finally see a, you know their salvation. You know a Vermont farmer, you know, standing by the side of the road, you know leaning against his tractor, say you know okay we're going to ask him for directions. So they roll down the window and ask him you know. Do you know where the American dream is? And he kind of looks at him and goes, hey, up. And I go, so, <laughs> you know, tell us where the American dream is. You know, like kind of an irritated question. And he goes, well, thinks about it a bit. And he goes, well, I can't get there from here. And that kind of sums up where we're right now with this, this economy, the way things work, uh, how our lives is we can't get to that American dream. We can't get to where we want to go with the way things work. So in order to get there, we're going to have to reinvent. And the way that we're going to reinvent our future and, and, and make our future a better place is to start to relocalize the economy, uh, to turn it into, turn our communities into resilient communities. And resilient communities are pretty different from the kind of communities we live in today. We live in hollow communities today. Communities that don't produce things. You know, they don't produce food. They don't produce or harvest water. They don't uh, produce product in any meaningful fashion. They're pretty much just uh, you know, a collection of homes. They're empty homes. They're boxes for, you know, Chinese brick or back, and we power them with, with fuel or energy that you know, used to be some West Virginia mountain. Uh, it's, we get our food from thousands of miles away. You know, that has lost its vitality and its freshness. It's it's uh, you know been desiccated and GMO'd and, and you know cartoned and carbonized. <laughs> I mean, it's just to be able to survive the transportation process. Uh, that is not going to be good enough going forward because the global system that we're relying upon, uh, because we live in these hollow communities, is starting to show some signs of wear. It's starting to break down. Um, the biggest thing we've seen is that the, the global economy and the global system, the global financial system, uh, is inherently 
unstable. You know, 2008 really showed that we don't know. I mean, we really don't know how the thing works. And you get the CFO of Goldman Sachs standing up in front of an audience and saying, this was a one in 10,000 year event, means he doesn't have a clue. I mean, he doesn't have a data set for 10,000 years. <laughs> it doesn't exist. So all the modeling software, and I was in derivatives trading for, you know, trained up for that for a while. So I know, you know, the, the, gut, not, you know, the guts of the system, it, they don't have a clue as to how it works. That's a bad thing. And that means that we're going to have crash after crash after crash. It's also unsustainable. And you know, we can see this, obviously, in the environment. I mean, we're messing. We're basically modifying and, 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 and increasingly damaging an even more complex system that we don't understand. And now it's starting to become unhinged, go nonlinear. We're getting you know, climate disaster after disaster. And I was just at the climate uh, conference or the environmental conference at Aspen you know, this summer. And you, know, you hear these eminent biologists like E.O. Wilson stand up there and say, you know, we could have whole sections of the world you know, classified as dead zones in the not too distant future. Nothing will grow. No plant, animal, or microbial life, zero. Now that's kind of getting to the point of, you know, that movie The Road, <laughs> you know, where everything dies and just won't support it because the systems are broken. Uh, so it's unstable, unviable, or I mean unsustainable. Uh, and the last part is it's unviable. And what I mean by unviable is that it's not performing as advertised. It's not delivering us the kind of results that we wanted. And you can see that really very simply in the true measure of how good or how well the US economy and the European economy has been performing is that the incomes you know, of Americans, the net worth, the household net worth of Americans is lower than it was in 1980. And that doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat in office or Republican in office, it's just failing. It's breaking. And it's getting worse and worse and worse with each year. And we're on the downslope now. I mean, incomes went down another 1.5%, even though the GDP, the top level number, was going up just last year. And it's not getting better. You know, all the wealth is moving to global banks. Global banks are you know, siphoning that and then gambling. Because when you extremely concentrate wealth in extreme levels, it ends up as gambling and non-investment. Just the way it is. The returns aren't good enough on long-term investments. So. You got a system that we're dependent upon, we're hopelessly dependent upon, because we don't do anything ourselves. We've given up every level of independence that we used to have 100 years ago, and the system's breaking down. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to build resilience, is to build resilience at the local level, because we can't solve the global system. We can't solve the problems of the global system. Not only do we not understand it, it's that it's beyond our ability to do so. The political process is stuck at the national level or the subnational level, and the problems we're dealing with are at the global level. There's no global control system or any way of influencing what's going on. You try to control carbon with Kyoto and jet in, in the US and China break. No one can agree on anything. So what do you do? You take control of the things that you can, you can have influence over, the things in front of you, the things that are human scale. You can create environments that can weather almost any kind of disruption, any kind of problem. And strangely, when you start looking at building resilience, building local, viable communities, it solves all the problems at the global level. Environmentally, economically, and in terms of quality of life, in terms of actually delivering on the pursuit of happiness. So what do you do to get a resilient community going? is you start producing. You start producing at the local level. You start producing food through CSAs, through innovative work like foodscaping, where you, we have more landscapers now than farmers, and converting and scaling up them to a level where they do permaculture and, and integrated gardens and helping people turn their homes into productive environments, turn their environments into productive spaces. Like the people in Todd Morton in England they, with their incredible edible program, their volunteer program, actually put food production in every single nook and cranny, 
every public space that was available, integrated it into the food that the kids ate at school, and started integrating it into the curriculum. And it wasn't, in the US, a lot of times people think, oh yeah, food production's easy, put a seed in the ground. Why would you want to teach that at school? Well, it's, it's, it's a, it, an element of life, it's like so basic to know where your food came from adds a level of meaning and authenticity to your life that you can't get online. It's like actually a counterweight to all the kind of life that we're losing by going online, where it keeps us grounded by knowing where your food is coming from, knowing who grows it, who's producing it, and how it's produced. You can harvest water, and, I, and one of the things I've done as I started to cover rainwater harvesting and rainwater you know, harvesting systems is that people can go out there and start businesses to help people set up the systems they need to just get as much water as they could possibly ever use just by capturing the rain that falls on their property. I mean, even in dry environments, you can radically change your entire you know, water footprint by capturing the rain or water that, you're, that drops on your, your property and using it correctly. Or you can produce energy, and there's lots of different energy solutions. There's you know, solar energy co-ops, but solar tends to be a little bit more expensive than, now than, it, than uh, you would like for just standard use for heating homes and things. Uh, but it's fantastic for mobile and, and, and in off-grid situations. Or you can start local biomass. And you can even make your own pellets, biomass pellets. that can be used in pellet stoves for heating homes and, and hot, hot water production. Creating an opportunity for a local biomass industry that uses leaves, uses grass clippings, uses any kind of biomass that's, that isn't usable in other locations. And you can make things. And it's making things, it's, it's, it's more than just having fun on an artistic level, which, that, of course, that's behind the creativity that, that uh, uh, makes you know, maker spaces you know, and hacker spaces so, so fun. It's actually taking those things that you're making and then selling them on a global market. It's like a friend of mine who said you know, his, her son was uh, making toy guns. You know, they're the kind of, you know, ray guns that, that, you know, look like the ones that you see in all the, all the different movies from the, from the uh, uh, steampunk ones all the way up through. And he's making these and he's shipping them all over the world. And she goes, you know, he's not focusing on the getting the job at Apple or, or the big movie theater or uh, studios. I go, well, why would he want to do that? He's got a career. <laughs> Selling those toy guns. I mean, there's a market for those. All the cosplay folks out there everywhere that want the ultimate piece or, or, or accessory for, their, for what they're doing. And then there's the higher end, like the Seven Cycles out of Boston. Uh, they've got 30 people employed there. They're making titanium bikes that they sell all over the world. And they're employing all those folks at, at middle class or better incomes, all locally, all connected. And they use what's called a, we don't hear this much in the States, it's called the Mittelstand approach, it's out of Germany. In Germany, they, they don't send you to college, they send you to you know, guild or trade school. There's 360 guilds. And you go in and you work at a company, and the company doesn't take on debt, doesn't grow fast, doesn't change its markets fast. It's very focused on a very small niche, but it knows everything about that market. And when the opportunity presents itself, it slowly takes on a new niche or converts itself, or incorporates new technology when it wants to stay competitive. And that's the kind of thing we're going to see more and more of as we create more and more niches, putting together those you know, 10,000 customers from everywhere around the world to buy the product that's made locally. And resilient communities help that by making spaces available for that kind of invention and that mutual support in, in making physical objects or in, in Co space, or you know, co-working spaces, actually doing you know, service delivery and building businesses in the conventional space. So, I mean, the goal here at, at the end of the process of creating these things, creating these resilient communities at the local level, is to be able to tell your kids, grandkids, when they come up and ask you, you know, hey, is it true that you know we used to have you know places where you had to you know travel to work? or that uh, they didn't had houses that didn't have gardens, 
you didn't know who grew the food, or that you had to get energy from the deserts of the Middle East and had to ship it all the way here. Or, you know, it was really hard to find somebody to do some work with, or, you know, you were doing all your work alone, or for some bank that you didn't ever meet. And I go, well, we used to live in communities like that. No need more. Thanks. Have any questions? I'm an engineer too, I was astronautical, so I did satellite design. It's kind of off the beat, but. You know, there's a lot of different flavors. It's, uh, it's really ad hoc. There's the transition towns, which is more kind of energy descent. They do bits and pieces of it. <clears throat> there are also tech, there are a lot of movements that are unfriendly to tech, but um, I think tech is a, you know, an essential piece of this. I'm being able to sell online, being able to and, and actually make money. And there's lots of parts of this movement too uh, that's uh, you know kind of anti-commercial. But you know what? One of the big failings in a lot of movements is you're not they don't help you make money because you have to live in the real world, right? You have to be able to pay for things. It just is just the way things work. So the best resilient communities are the ones that recognize that reality, okay, and can compete in the current world. And then can get people and track people's hearts and minds and hands and, and you know, so they can vote with their feet and, and help out. Um, so it, they're happening everywhere. I mean, you look at the Transition Towns map and it's, it's spread out I mean, all across the U.S. and the U.K. and in Europe. Uh, there's lots of folks working on, on, on different parts of, it, of the movement, the maker movement. You can see hackerspaces everywhere. Uh, and f the funny part is everyone's working on the same thing. They're relocalizing. And in a lot of what we're producing on the global level too is you know done through open source development. You collaborate. That's your company that you're collaborating with, but they're not tithing you for it. Yep. Could you repeat the question? which which intentional community was the best? Impressed me the most. I don't want to be mean. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, everyone's at a different stage of development, and I really don't want to say that, hey, you know, this community is farther ahead or less. You know, and there, you know what? One of the things I found is there's a lot of different politics involved in this, and I'm personally apolitical. You know, I don't think there's a political solution to anything that's going on now. So I, you know, I'm focusing on what I can actually change, right? And uh, you know, a lot of people have different ways of which they think the community should work. And the beauty of a decentralized system is that they can opt in to the one that works for them. Some people like co-housing. Some people like individual homes and in development. Now, some people want to eat together. Some people don't. It's, it's really, it's, it's highly varied. And trying to develop the best practices, too. I mean, like, for instance, I, I was working on a report on water harvesting systems. Everything from, you know, how you, you know, waterscape your yard or pieces of property to, you know, very detailed instructions, soup to nuts, on how do you put in a water harvesting irrigation system, you know, taking it up a notch, and, and through every single process in terms of selecting things. So, yeah, getting people to think. Structuring a very fast and moving and fluid environment in a way that allows them to make their own decisions because I can't make their decisions. Yeah. No, there's bits and pieces going on all over the place in, in, in the New York and Triborough area. So uh, um, how do we... I mean, I don't know if there's any one solution or one way to package it. Um, lots of templates being developed. And the most you can do right now in this kind of you know, very fluid environment is, is try to package the templates so they're palatable, like a solar coal op. You know, how do you build a solar, solar coal op? Uh, and how do you package it such that people start you know, instituting it in their, in their neighborhoods and you know, getting their neighbors involved? How do you set up a community garden? How does it work? 
You know, how do you incorporate that into a school system or into a school lunch system? So they're actually eating. There's a cycle. Key here is not to do everything in, you know, just as a one-off, is to do it in a way that creates a feedback cycle that is reinforcing. And the way you get that reinforcing element is that people spend more of their time because they're happier doing it and they're supporting themselves more from doing it. Um, net net, at the end of the day, what you'll end up with is a set of communities that actually deliver more on the happiness function than, than anything we've had today. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't like the term crowd financing because you know, crowd is, assumes you're, you're, you're anonymous. It's actually community financing. People back things that are they're in the community, whether it's an online community or a local community, and they back things that they have a passion for, they want to see. And the most successful ones, projects online, typically are the ones that are not asking for money as a donation. They're asking for people to buy their product as a, as a presale. They want to see it built. So I guess kids started yesterday, I think, uh, you know, revise their, how they, uh, makers actually can, can put their product up in terms of you know, uh, advertising to people. So local capital, um, lots of ways to do that. There's, you know, barter systems that you can do online. There's, there's you know, co-op banking. Uh, there's, uh, you know, very wild stuff on the Bitcoin side. There's, you know, it's, it's too fluid right now for me to you know, come down and say this is the way to do it. Um, I mean, oh. oh, of course. In fact, if I, if I, if I had any advice for people on, on you know, where to put your retirement funds, is I wouldn't be putting it in any global asset. <laughs> I would be investing it local. And because when this system goes down, every global asset goes from here to here. I don't care if you're in gold, because I mean, gold's only a percentage of that smaller pie. The thing that actually will have value as these global assets contract or, or die off is the stuff at the local level, is the stuff that produces year in, year out. It's the water production system, the energy production system, the food production system, the people that are making product at that local level, the people that you can actually have influence over. Because, you know, Hey, you know, if you want long-term security, that's the place to put your dollars. It's not in some pension fund. We've already seen those things. Like the level of fraud and theft going on that's unpunished in this system is just insane. And that's, for a system based on distrust, very, very, very bad. So, uh, does that answer it? Yeah. Yeah. I use a co-op, and it's probably one of the best-run banks in the country. It's USAA, because I was in the military, I got into that. Uh, they do my insurance, they do all my banking, um, and it's cooperative, and I get a payment at the end of the year. Um, so it's not, you know, for people who are typically you know, very, very pro-capitalist and military folks, it's, they're actually using something that's a cooperative. <laughs> so I always have to remind those folks to bring them back into reality. Um, but um, anyway, thanks a lot. I think my time's up. One more question? Anyone have one last one? I'm like a fire hose, so I'm sorry. I'm like, boom. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you know, there's um, three general categories. There's the folks that are doing it in existing communities, like there's, you know, from Detroit to Cleveland uh, to, uh, you know, everywhere. There's people are trying to set up like little transition towns. They're trying to retrofit it. And they're doing it program by program, like Todd Morton did, you know, with their Credible Edible program. They just got it going and volunteers and ad hoc it. Um, and then there's folks who are building it from scratch. Those tend to be smaller. And they are divided into two pieces. There's ones who are kind of intentional, kind of more cooperative, where they buy a piece of land, like 
the Echo Reality folks out in, in Canada on the you know, South Channel, or is it South Channel? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, they bought 43 acres and then sharing ownership. Or uh, the uh, traditional development where they're actually buying land and instead of a golf course, they put in a farm. And they put in water harvesting. And they're making, they're starting with pieces, but they're gonna eventually get to the same place that I'm talking about. And there's even ones that think that there's too much in political instability and if you have the means that you should actually you know, start up a community internationally as kind of a backdoor. Because you, you never know which groups can end up being targeted <laughs> if the political system gets, gets tough, right? So uh, anyone can be, end up as scapegoat or you know, find yourself on the wrong side of the authoritarian structure. You know, I'm ex-military, so I've seen all the, you know, how the direction this is going and it's not going in the right direction. So um, yeah, those communities, international communities go from anywhere from Chile, I'm going to one in Fiji, just because there's money being put into actually making resilience real. I thought it was really cool to go see, to see it in practice and get a trip to a nice place. Um, so that's the last question. Thank you so much. Visit resilientcommunities.com and uh, you know, hope, hopefully if you have any questions or you're working on a resilient community yourself or pieces of it, uh, get in contact with me and you know, hey, I, you know, there's lots of great people I can probably connect you with. Bye.